uh, it is the emperor who has no clothes on and no one is saying the truth, right? Like no one dares to say that al big alcohol has promoted this lie for over a hundred years. And, uh, and I think we're starting to wake up to that reality. I think we're starting to have some people kind of call it out for what it is. That was Chris Marshall of Sands Bar. I'm Martin John, your host of this, the Recover Yourself podcast. In this episode, Chris and I are talking all about how big alcohol is desperately grasping at the health and wellness movement as they see their customers decline. We also break down different stages of recovery and talk about how Chris has grown over the last eight years into his long-term recovery. Finally, this episode ends with not only a giveaway from RK Beverages, but Chris is going to walk us through three different zero-proof cocktails. So stick around to the end and be sure to take advantage of your opportunity to get a bottle of one of RK's zero-proof spirits. Um, and I like that you have this thing dry, right? Dry, right? Right in front, like it just says dry. I like that. So um, when I was young, uh, I, I had a lot of experience traveling places and people mentioning to me that these are dry counties. Did you have oh, experiences yeah. with? Oh, like I mean, I grew, actually, I grew up in a, uh, I was born and raised in my early years in a county in Texas that's a dry county. So. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, yeah. It's still a thing in the South. Like there's plenty of dry counties in the South. Yeah. So, I mean, where does that stem from? Does that stem from prohibition or? Prohibition. Uh, you know, uh, there's a great documentary. Ken Burns did this great documentary on prohibition and I've watched it like four times. It's just my like go-to because I, I find that there's just so much history repeating itself. Here we are on the cusp of 2020 and a hundred years ago, there was a movement um, gaining traction in this country that was about temperance and was about uh, living a dry lifestyle. In fact, they called people dries versus wet. Um, wow, that's okay. it's kind of the, uh, the history of that. So uh, after um, prohibition ended, a lot of the counties, especially in the South and Bible Belt, um, elected to keep uh, their counties dry. Now, what, like, I, I want to talk a little bit about this just because it's, it's, it's fascinating. And talk to me about the temperance movement from your standpoint, because you have a dry bar, right? Like you have yes. like, yes. you know, so, so like, pr do you promote like dry lifestyle or is it just lifestyle choice for you? Well, the, the, the temperance movement of a hundred years ago was uh, many things. It was, um, uh, Yes, there was an element of people who really saw how pervasive alcohol was in the, in the early American uh, landscape. I mean, it was a uncommon, or it was a common thing rather, to have uh, a pint of beer uh, with your dinner and pint of beer with your lunch. And in fact, as the country expanded to the West, alcohol was safer to drink than water. So, I mean, it was just a pervasive thing in our early country. And what some people realized is that alcohol was not serving them in um, a number of ways. And really, this was a women-led movement where uh, this, this kind of predated the uh, Women's Voting Rights Act um, and, and amendment uh, to the Constitution. And there was just this groundswell of people, ordinary people, who just decided that alcohol had uh, destroyed their lives and impacted their lives in negative ways. Uh, that's how it started. Uh, and then what happened was, like everything in this country, uh, we find ways to otherize people, to make them different and divergent. And so uh, the temperance movement became this social movement whereby uh, we saw this influx of immigrants coming in from Germany and Poland and other countries. And they did not look and sound like the Americans that only been there like a hundred and something years themselves. But you know, they're different. They, they were killing people first. What's up? Right. Like, right. <laughs> they, they don't belong here. They're, and so the temperance movement was a way to, um, to fight against what they felt was this encroachment on their culture. And, um, and the temperance movement turned into something completely different um, to the point where uh, it, it was driving out Catholicism and, and anything that did not look American. And so uh, it, it really turned into something else. And then I just watched that documentary so many times because I, I want to learn from history. Um, and I believe that the temperance movement began with, with good motives. But the biggest takeaway is that you cannot 
legislate morality. You cannot Absolutely, tell people yes. what they can and can't do. And I think that's a very uh, important message as this kind of second wave of um, evaluating our relationships with alcohol takes hold in this country. Wow, that's beautiful, man. And and like, what a great, like, I'm getting back to watch that documentary like tonight, like whatever, you know. Oh, it's so good because I, I think it, uh, when you look at how important prohibition was, prohibition, yes, was this thing that was about kind of health and wellness, but then it was also about all these other kind of things. The, the Ku Klux Klan uh, rose in power based on prohibition. Uh, we had organized crime in this country because of prohibition, right? There were mm -hmm. no real organized crime gangs uh, until, you know, the 20s. And you see these huge uh, organizations in Chicago and New York and Boston and Seattle, uh, all these uh, prohibition or, you know, kind of anti-prohibitionists uh, creating these, these industries. We, we have NASCAR because of Prohibition. I mean, there's. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, just rum runners and, and that, you know, making faster engines and bigger engines. And uh, it really revolutionized our country. Uh, but it also taught us a very important lesson that drinking and your relationship to alcohol is a deeply personal uh, choice. And it's one that um, the government has really no uh, power to, to say how you have that relationship. You know, that's, it really does not. Uh, belong government does not belong uh, in our in our bar, bar rooms or our bedrooms uh, yeah. you know we're kind of free to be our own we, we, yeah we can we could talk about what they're trying to like and place laws on right like right. like if you're a woman okay down your pants sure but in your bar no right like right. like right. it's yeah it's so I and, and I see that you know some of these old some of the oldest companies that we have in this country uh, Anheuser-Busch you know mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, with Schlitz. I mean, all these companies, yeah. um, they, they were started before Prohibition and they've endured. And I think what happened was after Prohibition, they just grew and grew and grew. And now I think society's creating kind of a sort of checks and balance and saying, wait a second, you know, this is, a, this is becoming as pervasive as it was. And we're seeing the same negative effects. And, and big alcohol, much like big tobacco, um, is really trying to figure out how to position itself in this new landscape. Oh, yeah. And that's, it is, and, and this, this comes out in my mind culture, and this comes out where it's like there is, there are messages that are seeping in through, through the cracks, essentially. Like, they, like we are, we as people in the United States are only so, are only able to be so aware of what's coming in because so right. much is coming in, especially through social media and everything else. Um, so how much time do you have in the, in the recovery world? So I got sober February uh, 16th, 2007. Okay. So I'll celebrate 13 years uh, next February. That's huge. 13 years is definitely, you know, like you've been through like, like I always, I always like to break it up and, and it's interesting how I break it up because I break it up into like one to five is like that suicidal crazy, like fucking, oh my God, early recovery. And I yeah. know people who are in like, who get four years and, and I'm like, well, you're still in early recovery. And they're like, what? I can't, like, I've been here four years. I'm like, yeah. And you're still going nuts. Like, like you still haven't yet been faced with those things that you were hiding with alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. Those are just starting to come up. Right. And and then it's like five to seven, eight years. I look at it as that midway where it's like you've kind of gotten a semblance of like what you're recovering and how this is going to go. But it's really it's really just like day by day and everything can change. And then mm -hmm. after eight or nine years or seven, eight, nine years, like it levels off and then you start living your life again and you start living your life in this real true way. Mm -hmm. um, so so talk to me about a little bit about like your path in recovery like and i want to like focus on like these last you know six seven years that have that have rebuilt your life for you right so i i totally kind of agree with that assessment and and uh you know i know that there's going to be someone listening that's in year like two and they're like what i don't <laughs> right and they're gonna be like no i got it together and that's fine and some people may 
but um from what i from what i and maybe we have experienced like that's that's you know good luck for the next couple of years <laughs> well what i've also discovered is that i've been doing this long enough to know that um i will look back uh in five years and look at year 12 and say man i thought i had it together i did not have it together i mean Absolutely. This is, i just continuously do that so if you're on year one or if you're in year zero um you're always going to look back and that's a sign of progress if you can look back and say, you know what, what I thought was kind of wellness and my best self was just the best I could do at that time, right. then th that's a sign of progress. And I just, I, you know, I think that's important. So I've been sober long enough to know I don't have it all together as, as well as I think I do. And, uh, you know, I can look back in a couple of years and say, uh, you know, I, I could do better. So, but to your, to your question, um, so that, you know, kind of seven, eight year uh, window uh, puts me well into my recovery, obviously. Um, and I was in school, uh, become a counselor, became a counselor. And, uh, you know, looking back now, I can see that decision was based on um, just not having a real direction and um, being naturally good at counseling. Um, but I wasn't, I don't think that that's what I, I mean, it was the best I could do at the time. It, you know, it wasn't, yeah. it, I don't know if it was the best fit for me, but I, you know, it's just one of those hindsight things. Whereas, you know, I, I can look kind of back and say, you know, it seemed right at the time. Yeah. yeah. Seemed right at the time. You know, I, I look at kind of life as a series of, uh, there's, there's this kind of reality that we existed and then there's all these other possible realities. Right. right. And in some other reality, uh, at that turning point, I decided to go pursue my passion to become a journalist. You know, um, mm -hmm. that's, that's been my lifelong love. I've always wanted to become a journalist. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't do that. But what I did do was say, okay, my love for storytelling and hearing story um, fits perfectly into what I love about counsel. And that's really, I think, really what sustained me for the next kind of eight years as a professional counselor was not so much the fact that I wanted to help people, but I was so interested in hearing stories. Right. Um, I, I'm much more fascinated about that and, and, and learning about people and really understanding them uh, than I ever was about like this kind of false notion that I was on some conquest of, you know, like, uh, you know, like I'm on some mission from, you know, a power greater than myself. Like none of that ever fit for me. It was all right. about, I want to hear your story and I want to know like within your story, how can we change the narrative? Well, that's great. Um, what is the, like, what are some of the, like, key takeaways for you in terms of, like, oh, aha moments that made you, like, finally kind of, like, settle into who you are? I know we had talked about your fascination with Cheers when you were growing up. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's, I, I see that, and the counseling thing does kind of tie into that. I believe that uh, I had to have that set of experiences. Uh, and in fact, it was as a counselor that I decided to be, you know, to do this Sands Bar thing. Um, but, but now I look over my life and kind of using today as a baseline, I see that um, all the pieces were always in place, right? Um, before I was conscious of it, all the seeds were being planted. Um, and I grew up, you know, in a family that didn't drink. Um, I watched Cheers as a kid, and I just had this fascination and almost romanticism uh, about the idea of a, of a bar, and um, I thought Sam was just so wise, and so, and, and the laughter, and the community, and camaraderie, just, I mean, this was like at like nine or ten. Right. <laughs> like, and, and um, you know, like for those who don't know Cheers, like Sam is a sober bartender. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, and I didn't make that connection at the time. But I just remember just, you know, loving uh, just all the characters and just loving how they cared about each other and all these complexities that emerged um, when these people sat at a bar and they had this experience. And so uh, that was a very early seed that I, that I almost just forgot. Like it just, it was there and I just wasn't, you know, aware that it was still growing in the back of my brain somewhere. Um, then I have my own experiences. I get sober, become a counselor, and that early seed is married with this real need that I see um, in society to connect to people. And it, and it matches well with my own need to connect because that is ultimately in sobriety, 
something I found was a real challenge for me was to connect with other people. So it was something that was always there, always felt different from everyone. Um, that was just kind of my, my, my kind of temperament. Um, mm -hmm. Just, just always felt kind of like I was isolated from the world. Uh, I always felt different. Um, and so when I got sober, uh, I had to, I mean, out of necessity, right? Like I'm in year one through four, I'm just in survival mode, just right. getting through, just, I, I show up because I need to show up and I make myself uncomfortable because I need to make myself uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I, I go to the meeting after the meeting because I, I need to. Right. Not because I want to. Mm -hmm. That was my that was my that was my experience as well. No, I get it. Like I utilize shame and all of that kind of like I used a lot of negative stuff that I would deem negative now just to get different. And that is a big part of this idea of recovering from you made mm -hmm. choices that, that now you have to get away from those choices that you made. And how are you going to do that other than just make other choices that you don't want to make? That's exactly what I, I felt was like, you know what, I have to run away from this thing. And uh, I was never really quite sure of what I was running towards, what I was recovering towards. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so that became a little more clear when I became a counselor in those early years, because I, I felt um, myself drawn to, um, to helping people. And then I would also just feel very alone. And I you know, got married, I had, uh, we adopted two kids. Um, uh, you know, just all these wonderful things happened in my life but I was not feeling very deeply connected. And, you know, I would go to therapy and kind of talk about the sense of like on the outside of life, things look really, really good, but I still feel so lonely and I right. still feel like, um, like what I'm doing in this world isn't, it doesn't really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And how has that changed now? So now, uh, so I, so let me answer that question with like a continuation of the story. Please so, <laughs> so I start Sands Bar with the, with the complete, um, and at the time, you know, it seemed right, with right. this idea that it, this was about helping other people. In what right? Well, I was going to create this bar, and it was going to be a place for people to gather where they could feel a little less alone. And it was not about Chris and his loneliness. It was about everyone else and their right. need. <laughs> you know, like I totally externalize, right? Right. Like this, like this, this, this gnawing thing that I have at my soul. Yeah. And I make it about everyone else, and I make yeah. it about creating a space for other people. We, uh, you know, I, I started this this sober bar thing, and and I'm I'm talking about publicly podcast interviews. I'm talking about this being a space for other people to connect, and, and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing people walk into Sands Bar. Um, they're lonely. They're, they're, they may, and a lot of people that come to Sam's Bar aren't sober. Um, they're just people who feel so disconnected from everyone else in society. And I think that as much as Sam's Bar is about sobriety, it's about connecting to the, to the whole of society. I really do think that is, you know, what makes this thing special. Right. So I'm watching this happen and I had a few customers just kind of, try to connect with me. And I was like, well, no, I'm not here to, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here <laughs> to help everyone else see right. their loneliness and help them create community. I don't need community. I'm good. Um, and boy, uh, I had uh, a very good friend. She's a good friend now. Her name's Aubrey. And she uh, just said, Hey, let's go grab some coffee. You know, I had another, you know, guy uh, that came to the bar, Jetty, he was a kind of business guy. He was like, let's, let's talk business, but let's also just talk, like, how's your life going? Right. And I almost repelled it. Yeah. Because it felt very foreign to me. It felt uncomfortable. Yeah. Your whole life, you didn't allow yourself, you didn't permit yourself to to accept that help. And then, then you're like, I'm going to create something so other people can have this thing that I so desperately desire. Right. Like, I mean, it's, and again, that's what hindsight is. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I don't think I could, I don't think I was um, brave enough to say I need this for myself. Um, 
I made it about everyone else. And, and again, I, I feel like in, when I say that now, I don't feel an ounce of shame or guilt or anything about that. I, I understand that that was the best I could do because I, I so that's been a lifelong struggle for me. You know, I, we're not going to delve into my past, but no. I, I, it is part of something I've struggled with since I was in kindergarten. I felt different from everyone else. And so uh, here were a group of people who were radically actively accepting me. And it, and it was just um, what I've been searching for my whole life. They, I, I struggle with that, that kind of stuff, you know, on the regular, like, like there's always these sorts of things that come up, you know, it's like, oh, there's another thing I'm not permitting myself. And, and we don't see it. It's so insidious. It's deep inside. And, and, and what I noticed is when I look out at the world and I am critical of things, that's because usually I'm not permitting myself to accept that, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being critical of. Well, that's great. So what is so what is the vibe and what are you trying to create as the vibe of Sands Bar? So I think the the vibe or uh, what I try to really do is create a um, environment in which conversation is the centerpiece. Mm -hmm. um, I really I want to get back to this sense that you can walk into a space and meet strangers and connect with strangers, not just your friends or not just a business meeting, but right. the connect with people who uh, comprise your neighborhood and your community. So Sands Bar is really connection centered and um, conversation centered. And so we do that, we achieve that environment in a number of ways. Uh, we offer like live music, but that music isn't always, uh, you know, so loud you can't hold a conversation. Right. Uh, we do karaoke, we have game nights, we have a lot of activities going on inside the bar. Yeah. We're doing all these kind of fun things that um, you'll find in any other bar in right. Austin around the country. Uh, and it just doesn't have alcohol. And, and I know that it's a successful night at Sands Bar when I can close my eyes and I can hear all the sounds of a bar. That That's how you couldn't tell me that I wasn't in a sober bar it sounds right. full of conversation full of glasses clanking that is that's how i know that you know we're doing well so so sans bar is uh it's this thing that's growing and evolving and becoming its own thing yeah do you uh now 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 you did pop-ups but you have a brick and mortar now yeah yeah so we started off in austin austin has this reputation and we're also a college town and uh mm -hmm. you know kind of a more liberal than the rest of Texas. And so right. we, we, we have this like kind of energy that's young and fresh. And we have, you know, I think Google here and, you know, Facebook's here. And we have all these other companies that are kind of tech companies. So we're becoming this kind of uh, Silicon Valley of the South kind of thing. Right. So there's just this party kind of atmosphere. And, and it, it's so hard for people to stay sober here hmm. because drinking is so pervasive i mean i saw an ad the other day for a bible study and craft beer night i mean it's, i love the yoga and beer and like like everything like yoga wine and like just just pairing things with alcohol makes them accessible somehow like hey right and i mean and that's that's everywhere you go there's there's some opportunity to have alcohol. I mean, uh, it was a couple months ago we had a entire kind of wellness fair put on by a beer company. Right. And it's just and and this is big alcohol's attempt to uh, move into this wellness space because they're seeing their numbers plummet. Right. And and much like prohibition, right? Like the like here we come full circle. Much like prohibition, big alcohol is going to find all of its ways to to lobby the government and, and to to spread this new message that alcohol is not only uh, acceptable but it's accessible right. for everyone. And it's not, you know, like and and they're really backpedaling on the the health aspect of it. Like, you know, they're trying to come out and say, well, it's part of wellness, 
we are we are the backbone of like the wellness industry right like we're like alcohol is being alcohol is you know like alcohol is 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 attached to raising your child alcohol is attached to um your yoga studio alcohol is attached to every art gallery you'll go to right like no i mean it's it's absolutely you know a thing that i see uh, so often, and it's, uh, it's, it's really just kind of disgusting uh, that, that there's just, in fact, I, I was uh, part of kind of organize, organizing an, an event, and they were uh, discussing, you know, how can we raise money for this event, and, you know, they're going to have a silent auction, but well, we have to have alcohol there, because we have to get people liquored up, so that way they'll, they'll spend more money, they'll donate more money, so you're telling me that you're going to use alcohol to make people less um, conscious of what they're doing, right? And you're gonna kind of exploit that. Like that just, there's just a lot of kind of this unease I'm beginning to have about just how alcohol is just used as a vehicle for so many kind of nefarious things in our society. You, if you want people to give more money, create a message that makes people want to give you more money as a nonprofit. Right. And, and don't use, alcohol to achieve social good it's it's just inherently flawed right. um that's like you know someone uh wanting to do good by doing it's like you know stealing to give to a charity like it's it's not okay i think it's intentional i think alcohol has positioned itself as this social lubricant that you must have if you're going to uh, move forward in any kind of business endeavor or relationship or be more creative or be sexier or be funnier. Um, it has, uh, it is the emperor who has no clothes on and no one is saying the truth, right? Like no one dares to say that al big alcohol has promoted this lie for over a hundred years. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're starting to wake up to that reality. I think we're starting to have some people kind of call it out for what it is. Sales. So, 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 how how do you feel about this idea of the of the even of even the word mocktail? Okay, so mocktail is not a dirty word. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not afraid of using the word mocktail. Uh, I have lots of friends who have businesses built around mocktails, um, and so the word mocktail does not bother me at all because it is the easiest and most accessible way to understand what these drinks are. Um, mm -hmm. But here at Sands Bar, we, we call our drinks zero proof cocktails because we really have spent the last two years uh, creating and crafting um, drinks that we think are as good, if not better, than some of the best cocktails uh, you know, served in uh, you know, Michelin star restaurants today. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what, what, what are some of those? And, and I have to say, what makes them better? Like, like you're, I mean, are you competing with a cocktail at that point? Because a cocktail is going to have that, like, going to have a, like that out, like it's going to have that over overtone of alcohol. Um, and you're not, you're not competing with that, let's say. No, you're not competing with that. But what I think you are competing with is complexity. And like, I love complexity. Um, to see all these things come on the, on the market today, that are fruity and flavored. And um, I was actually, I was at the store yesterday and uh, I'm looking at all these different seltzer waters that are alcohol seltzers. I don't, I'm like, we have one thing. We have, we have our seltzer. Like that is the one thing that most sober people um, that can handle carbonation can enjoy is seltzer. And right. you take that away from us by um you know you co-opted for your damn self <laughs> right and and to get it on this trend and that's what i'm saying like i think people are starting to wake up and understand just how slimy it is to create a product that mimics seltzer that looks like seltzer that talks about it being organic alcohol and gmo free and all these other health you know low calorie all these all these things are ways and attempts to get in get in on this wellness movement that is all that it is yeah. Um, big alcohol is terrified that they are losing customers and that the sales are continuing to decline yeah. and they are finding any way that they can uh, to become part of this wellness movement. They are putting all the cards on the table and they really do believe that this will um, keep them relevant. 
And I, you know, I've actually talked to a couple of companies that have had, like, I mean, I've had people come and ask me, Hey, we have a, we have a liquor company. What can we do so that we don't get swept away? And I said, the one thing you can do, um, and those are just really interesting conversations. Okay. And I want to, I, I help them because I need them to understand just how real this is. Uh, and I feel like I don't want them to, to draw their own conclusions. I want them to hear from someone who, and I can only speak for myself and my business, right? Right. Um, but I tell them, you know, if you really want to stay relevant, let people come to their own conclusions about drinking instead of pushing it in their faces. Yeah, you're you afraid know? of losing customers. Like, and, and that's so that, fear. Right. Leave sober people alone because it looks like pandering. It looks like you were trying to capture a lost audience and you're, right. and you're really targeting women. And I think that is something that, uh, you know, is just very obvious. And I think women are waking up just like a hundred years ago <laughs> and right. recognizing that this does not serve us. This is not, this does not make you any more of a, a professional or, or a, you know, someone who can go toe to toe with a man just because you can drink. Um, right. I think women are waking up around this, around the world and they're realizing mm -hmm. that alcohol is not serving them. And um, I just, I'm so glad that I can be a uh, witness to that history of women rising up and saying that they, they want a different life. Um, so Heineken Zero, what uh, thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I, I met, I actually met with Heineken. Um, and uh, my first, when they first come, we made contact, uh, I was just very against the idea of Heineken 0.0. .0. Um, one thing that's important to know about Santa Bar is so I believe in a 0.0, .0 bar. Uh, nothing that we serve has any alcohol. So that's kombucha, that's any, we don't serve near beers or anything like that has any. You don't serve kombucha? No, no kombucha okay. and no near beers. Uh, anything and everything that we serve has to have as Zero. little. Nothing, I mean, and not even in question. Not even in question. Now, now, if you look at orange juice, it does have hmm? some alcohol in it, right? So you can't um, completely remove alcohol from everything, but I, I won't knowingly serve something that has like even in a nominal Point zero to whatever yeah yeah, yeah yeah like i just i'm gonna you know stay away from that as much as possible so at first i was against this whole 0, 0.0 idea um and then i you know I, earlier or late i guess over, over the summer over the summer i decided to give uh heineken 0, 0.0 a chance and uh tested it at the bar and the response was very overwhelming and people really liked it um, and so I, you know, I think we're going to continue to, you know, to carry it at Sands Bar. Uh, I also have, uh, this other, you know, great 0, 0.0 beer brand that just came online, uh, Hairless Dog, uh, mm -hmm. which is just not only a great name, but also excellent branding and a great product. Uh, they yeah. have a coffee stout out that's just, just great. So I just believe that if you stay true to the 0, 0.0, the in a beer market would eventually respond to that because I, I they were they were kind of like well just accept that this is it all you're gonna have to get is you know you're gonna have some alcohol that's the way it is accept it and I just wasn't willing to budge and right, so yeah. yeah totally support uh zero point zero uh beer products product there's a lot of non-alcoholic spirits that are based in the UK because the UK is, and Europe has been doing sober bars for about 15 years. This is nothing new over there. Beautiful. And in fact, most, most of what I've learned has been from um, European counterparts and Australian counterparts. I mean, okay. this, is, this is a brand new market in a uh, brand new industry in the United States, but this is nothing new worldwide. In fact, of course, with, as with everything, we're like the last to like adopt this cultural trend yeah uh, yeah that's, that's that's especially when it's like especially when it's like alcohol tobacco firearms or like uh, we're gonna we're gonna it's like wait there's money there like and there's old american money there like we're not yeah. gonna touch that shit like yep. we're not gonna yep. touch that yep. yeah yeah my, my grandfather roll over in his grave <laughs> <laughs> but um so continuing on the zero proof cocktails what 
are some of your favorite that you guys have have worked with at Sands Bar that you might be able to share? One of my favorite drinks that I'm working on now is a uh, mango habanero uh, drink. And so we do what we do is we uh, I smoke the habaneros and yellow peppers over a mesquite fire. So they have Jesus, man, <laughs> you are and, you're super Texas. Go on. <laughs> I, look, born and raised, my friend. Born and raised. <laughs> oh, um, so we have this like this nice mesquite smoke, and it just permeates not yeah. only this habanero, but this yellow pepper, which actually gives uh, it a nice gives the heat a nice uh, kind of sweet. bottom, like yeah, a little sweetness, sweetness little, mm-hmm. little sweetness. Then I uh, infuse that in a mango simple syrup, and then we use mango pineapple juice. And this mango habanero that, that maintains this great smokiness. Wow. I mean, this, the smokiness is this next level. And then we add a shot of Seedlip 94. Now, Seedlip is a distilled non-alcoholic beverage. I, is- I haven't tried it yet, but I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued because I'm a spirits guy. So, like, like I'm, I'm intrigued. So, if you're a spirits guy, and we, I mean, we, could, we can talk offline, but uh, there's, <laughs> so many, there's so many intriguing things uh, to, to, hold, hold on one second. Mm-hmm. Hold on. I'm going to grab something. I'll be yeah, right yeah, yeah. All right. Let's, okay. Man, look at what. So, what is this RK in front of me? This. Oh, okay. So, so you said you were a spirits guy, and that's what Pete. Uh, my my initial. Let me go grab yeah. another. Grab some other cups. Hold on. So you might be able to hear me. Um, one of the big things that I um, <clears throat> I like we were talking about earlier, right? The, the giving oneself the permission to want. Mm. Um, And that is something that, you know, now that I'm looking at like, like now that I'm talking about like mocktails and zero proof cocktails with you and stuff, I'm like, have I ever, have I just not given my, myself permission to enjoy this because it's not a cocktail. So why do it? Right. Like, like, is that just a knee jerk reaction that I'm having? So I'm really intrigued that I'm like, that I'm, I'm getting into this and I'm, I'm, I'm like, cause I haven't thus far, like really explored the world of non-alcoholic spirits or non-alcoholic um, drinks much at all, other than, you know, like, Oh, congratulations wish, on your water. Would have, uh, I wish we would have, uh, I thought, wish I would have thought about this before because I, this is just what I have here. I mean, I have so much more at the bar. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, and again, this is just like part of uh, practicing for my master class. So it's very helpful. Okay, so oh, first thing I want to show you was this RK. Yeah, what is this? So RK is a company uh, based in uh, Laredo, Texas, so South Texas. And they create um, spirit-free spirits uh, that are okay. – um, very similar to their kind of alcoholic counterparts. Okay. Um, and, and I will say this, I, I'm not, this is an endorsement. I don't, you know, I'm not saying that this is for everyone. Ultimately at the end of the day, you have to decide what's best for you and mm-hmm. for your, you know, abstinence from alcohol. Uh, again, none of these products are, you know, paying me to say this, this is just something I had in my house. I'm excited to show you because you said you were a spirits guy. Yeah. This has not, but this is not me selling anything. It's just me, just like passionately. In yeah. Fact, I'm glad I don't have other things. Okay. So, uh, RK, this is the their Scottish whiskey. whiskey. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, a lot of people, uh, there it goes. A lot of people uh, purchase this this product in particular because it does kind of smell and taste. Uh, like, like alcohol mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and a lot of people who are just new to sobriety or struggling just to you know just get Keep through those early cravings yeah. um get to have a drink where they feel like um they are enjoying you know what they're what they're taking in so uh i just have like a actually just let me, plastic cups will be better to see it yeah yeah uh... And does it just, yeah, does that, oh, okay. So it's got a little pourer in there. like Yeah, uh, yeah, it's got the, a little. Oh, that's nice. A little tamper, oh. proof, which, I, which I appreciate because if you're, you know, the last thing you want to do is have some idiot, uh, you know, kind of. Pour, pour whiskey into your right. non-alcoholic whiskey. Oh, fuck all, yeah. 
And so the smell, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, dark. you know, like, like, like even 19 years, my, I can, I can feel my, 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 my salivary glands, like <laughs> starting to go. Like, I'm like, Oh, I, I know what that is. Like, you so, know, um, so I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah. There's, there's kind of a shot of whiskey. I'm going to do just a little bit of splash of Coke. Yeah. Classic. And Yeah, I mean it's just got it's it's got a good bite, a nice uh, little little warm on the back end. Like it's really, really? yes, it's really. Where did that come day. from without alcohol? So these uh, this product and uh, the creator, his name is Reynald. Uh, he created a chemical a molecule uh, that mimics that kind of warm sensation. Like as I'm even now, I can still kind of feel that kind of warmth in the back of my throat. Um, it's very subtle. I, I, I will say that, you know, even that little shot that I poured is probably, I'll probably do a half shot because I, I uh, don't fancy the, the taste of it, you know, just as much, but just right, a little yeah, yeah. I mean, you're looking to enjoy it, right? Like not just fucking like burn your throat. Yeah. So it's got also a little bit of, I think, peppers in it or pepper oil, mm -hmm. which also gives it that nice little spice, warm, spicy and warm. Um, so I, I think this is a really revolutionary product because uh, it's created with the sober person in mind. Yeah. And I think that that, that is, so they have uh, the whiskey, they have rum, they have vodka, they have tequila, they have everything. RK. RK. Yeah. RK. Okay. RK. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to give you a day on the court. <laughs> uh, I love introducing new products to people. And that is part of the fun when you come into Sandspar is, I mean, I get, you see how excited I get. This is, yeah. this is the most fun for me. And if you're at the bar, um, often I will just say like, I have this new cool product. Let's all try it. And, you know, um, <laughs> we get to try it. Yeah. The way that it, the Sandspar is that we do a uh, $15 cover and just pay what you can. So if you can pay the 15 you can, if you can't afford that, no worries. If you want to pay more than that to cover someone else, that's cool too. Yeah. And then it's unlimited drinks and uh, some very light snacks. Oh, okay. Well, that's, so, a, that's, a, that's an easy evening, man. Right. So for what you could pay for one drink, uh, one mocktail, mind you, in New York or LA, um, you're getting an entire uh, experience. And most times, Chris is going to just open up a bottle of alcohol-free wine, which uh, oh, which is just another whole or you know entity in unto itself. Right. But we get to make these fun drinks. And I get to show you how I make these drinks. So next we're going to make is a mule, and uh, we're going to use some dry soda ginger. So a great okay. dry. Let me use this other cup so you can so you can kind of see. Dry soda, and then I'm going to use uh, Fensimans. Uh, ginger syrup. Okay. Nice. So that's that. High concentrated ginger. And that's just a, that's that's just like a little, just a little bit of that. Or just a little bit of that, maybe a maybe a half shot. And then I'm gonna uh, add in some of uh, our Sandsbar uh, rosemary infused simple syrup. So what I did was I created a simple syrup just using uh, fresh rosemary. Uh, mm -hmm. Rosemary has some great natural oils in it, and uh, I, I think it really adds a woodiness to this, you know, particular drink. And another half shot of that? Maybe another half shot of that. I don't have any lemon at home or lime at home, but I'm going to use just some fresh uh, citrus. Okay. Fresh right here, just to squeeze. So that's just dry ginger soda yeah, and, but, and a uh, couple of syrups. Yeah, and if you're noticing that like all these products aren't exceedingly complicated, I'm not, I right. mean, that was, that was Arcane Coke, that was dry soda, this simple syrup, and then this house-made rosemary, which is a, which is, can be that's complicated. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I mean, see, you're also talking about like mesquite smoking fucking like ha ha habaneros, man. Like, so, so that's. 
it does get a little more complicated. But yeah. I mean, at its base level, you know, you can do something like that. And then the last drink I'll make is just the basic um, Paloma uh, using uh, hops water. Have you heard? Of this yeah. Hops? So I, I know of hops water. I haven't had it yet. Um, and uh, I think I think what's happening with this interview is like I'm changing. I, I'm changing my my uh, my shopping list. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. So, uh, you know, please, you know, share with everyone, like, these are options. That, these are all zero proof options that don't have any alcohol in them that aren't that, ex I mean, none of this stuff is like exceedingly expensive. Um, you know, it's so easy to make. So this hops water is literally hops water and mm -hmm. grapefruit. I mean, that's it. There's no extra additives. It has zero sugar, zero carbs, zero sodium. Um, it is fantastic. No juice. It's carbonated water, hops, and grapefruit flavor. That's no, awesome. that's it. That's so, it's, it. so they so they're just like soaking hops in some water and then like bottling it kind of thing, or how is that like? And, and is it hoppy? Oh, it's hoppy. So that was another thing because I was just drinking rot gut vodka. Right. I completely missed the whole about? like, <laughs> like <yeah. laughs> I, I missed the whole like, IPA craze. Yeah, no, I wasn't around for that. Yeah, yeah. You, were, yeah you got some before too. So I don't understand the lore of hops. And in fact, I, I can't recall what hops tastes like. Um, but when people come into the bar and they're just days or, you know, weeks sober, this green bottle is a life preserver. Wow. Because they're so used to something hoppy. So uh, we're going to use a little, little hops there. And then using my Heineken 0, 0.0. Nice. Wouldn't be a Texas drink without a little Topo Chico. Which Topo is Chico. A, Topo Chico is great. And then we're going to use a little bit of this. And I love finding, you know, ready-made mixes and, and syrups because it takes a lot of the guesswork out of what you're doing. Right. Um, and one company that we just love to death is this Bar Smith mix and uh, i haven't heard of them they're based in austin uh i think they also have operations in nashville tennessee as well but uh you know i find them at uh total one and more uh you know uh targets and things like that so okay they have this this paloma which is just already a little bit of hops and grapefruit so you're already adding kind of what's already with going on with the hops water you're just adding to that the Topo Chico gives a little bit of extra carbonation, kind of thins it out a little bit, mm -hmm. and then probably garnish this with a uh, dried blood orange wheel. Uh, and oh. I think that'd be really just beautiful. Um, so yeah, let me try this one. Mm. Yeah, all these products. I mean, again, I don't I don't make a dime off of them. Uh, I really just want people to know that these products are accessible, they're available, and you know, Sands Bar is leading the way in creating these great zero proof cocktails. Yeah, and and what a great interview. Oh my God. Thank you so much for sharing so much. I mean we went we went we went from top to bottom. So I'm really appreciative. And hell man, like you're doing great stuff and I'm really excited about about uh, getting in and, and getting this out so people can people well, can hear it. And you know I'll be in Chicago in May. I do, I do. And like I said, if you if you you know, you need another pair of feet on the ground, you just let me know. Oh, I may take you up on that. Well hey, I'm 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 here, I'm ready, I'm willing and I'm 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 excited. So definitely, man. Um once again, thank you again for taking time with us and I, I got nothing more, man. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your right. time. I want to thank Chris for sharing with us all of these cocktails as well as his story. I am super excited because I reached out to RK and we have a bottle of zero proof vodka from RK that we are giving away for this episode. And in the description of this video, you will see a link to the landing page of that contest. Visit that and enter many different times. The more times you enter, the more chances you have of winning. So definitely take advantage of that. And hopefully I can get this to you before the holiday and you can know that you will have an option. There are options out there and those options are increasing all the time. And I'm so grateful for being introduced to this by Chris because before now, 
before my conversation with Chris, I was not into mocktails. I was not into zero proof cocktails. And now he's piqued my interest. I've had a couple wonderful dry sodas as well as hops water. And the complexity of what these things can offer in terms of taste and in terms of body and in terms of just being able to enjoy a beverage that's not water has really um, been nice. And after 19 years, it's really nice to be able to widen my perspective and my options. Please consider supporting uh, this podcast or leaving me a message on Anchor, rating or reviewing this podcast on iTunes or any of the other podcast apps that you frequent. Thank you so much. I appreciate you listening and supporting the show. Recover Yourself is all about recovering the full you. It's not just about putting down who you don't want to be anymore, but it's about picking up who you do want to be and who you are. Okay, until next week, keep recovering yourself.